Do one minute. <laughs> While they come in, yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I can see um, <sighs> we've got lots of people logging in, which is great. Thank you. Particularly when it's a, a nice sunny day. We'll give it a few minutes. Stoking up. Right, I think I feel it's a bit like watching judging at Eurovision or something here, just watching the numbers. <laughs> Steadily click up as the participants head up. It was sort of speckled about there. Okay, so we've got 71 people logged on at the moment. It's still ticking up slowly, but that, that's great. We'll just make a start. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kate O'Donnell, uh, Professor and one of the Deputy Directors of uh, IHW. I'd really like to welcome everyone who has joined us uh, today for today's Morris Bloch lecture. It's such a shame that we don't have uh, George Davy Smith in Glasgow in person, so we'll just have to put that invitation out again once we can actually all meet. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know, um, George is a professor of clinical epidemiology uh, at the University of Bristol. Uh, and prior to that, um, when I first met George, he was in the Department of Public Health at the University of Glasgow. Uh, mm -hmm. He is, as he described in Wikipedia, and I think rightly, as, as uh, one of the uh, foremost epidemiologists in the UK, and certainly looking at your um, citations and the number of published papers, you've published uh, over so many areas, George, and I think many of us have followed a lot of your work. Uh, and it's really helpful in terms of your work around uh, understanding health inequalities and life course epidemiology. So thank you. George is going to be talking to us today about understanding the health consequences of, of educational attainment and think about genetic and non-genetic contributions to that. So I'll hand over to you, George, to share the screen. And thank you. Okay. Uh, let me know if that's worked. Has that worked? I think so. I can see it. You I should say it. that if you have questions as we go through, to post them on the Q&A and then we'll pick up at that at the end. Right. Okay. Okay, that should be the, uh, that That's us. Be the, yeah, the main slide. Uh, I'm just trying to move you out of the way so I can see my slides. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, okay, yeah, so um, yeah, I was looking forward uh, to uh, visiting Glasgow. Um, so it's a shame that I've not been able to. I'm sure it's glorious weather at this time of year. And uh, um, I'm just going to talk about um, uh, using um, different causal inference approaches, mainly uh, Mendelian randomization using genetic approaches, but a couple of uh, some other uh, others as well uh, to understand the effects of uh, educational attainment on uh, health. Uh, so I'm just I'm going to start with a, a background on socioeconomic position and health, which is, is an area I've spent a lot of time working on, uh, causal explanations for health inequalities, and then something on the limit, limitations of observational data on Mendelian randomization. Uh, education and potential, and then um, talk about how you can look at mediation using uh, Mendelian randomization, uh, and uh, then use the school leave, look at uh, briefly at some work on school leaving age, um, and finish on uh, future issues. So uh, this is going to be um, uh, not, not technical, uh, but I hope I've got a slide on further reading uh, at the end, and I'm, uh, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, questions. Um, uh, and there's a um, Q&A uh, box, uh, which Kate mentioned. Uh, if you type them in as I go along, 
uh, if, if you want, but I'll just answer, I'll answer them uh, at the end. I won't answer them uh, going wrong. Um, Matt doesn't seem to sort of work in this uh, format. Uh, so as Kate said, in the uh, um, early to mid 1990s, I, I uh, worked in uh, Glasgow uh, and a particular area of interest uh, was in socioeconomic uh, di uh, differences in mortality. Uh, and uh, one uh, study uh, done in Glasgow uh, was uh, based on actually going through a, a walk through the uh, graveyards. I loved the, I loved the uh, graveyards uh, and noticing that a large number uh, of the obelisks were of precisely the same uh, form, uh, form, as you can see with these uh, little spiked topped uh, obelisks on the photo uh, and um, thought that um, the cost of the obelisk would be basically, you know, uh, proportional uh, to its height. So, um, with a with a, a group of uh, students, um, we uh, measured the height of a thousand, uh, more, more than a thousand of these obelisks across all the across the graveyards, uh, and then took the uh, how long people lived. Uh, from the gravestones. So, so at the base of them, they would have things like this. Uh, and these could also be looked up in the books. The, 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 um, the people running the, uh, look, over, overseeing the graveyards were fantastic. They were actually closed uh, for uh, maintenance for some of this time, but we got special <laughs> permission to go in and measure them. Uh, and as I said, they also had book that you could go and consult the books for uh, some of them. So this is uh, one, um, I spent a lot of time trying to find out about David Wilkie, the, the writer, uh, when we were writing the paper, but from 1992 you couldn't do that. But now if you do a wiki you can find out, you can find his dates of marriage and uh, uh, how much he left in his will and stuff. You might Google them, but it's not wiki. Um, you can find all that information. Yeah, so so then we, uh, we looked at uh, age of death according to the height of the obelisks and the uh, hypothesis that uh, the, the longer uh, people lived, the uh, taller the uh, obelisk and, uh, and using the height of the obelisk as an indicator of how much people could afford. We actually, we found uh, records uh, about, um, about uh, prices. And one of the most surprising things during this was that granite was more expensive uh, than marble, which isn't what I'd have, uh, I would have thought. Uh, and so uh, what we, we showed was that the, the in, indeed the height of the obelisk uh, was uh, predicted uh, age at death and it did so in the central necropolis and sital graveyard. So that was, and that was of course, that was looking back to people uh, who had been born from the, from the late 1700s when you didn't have any sort of official statistics on uh, health inequalities. But it was of course, in the, it was in the Christmas BMJ rather than the, uh, usual uh, issues. Uh, and um, then uh, uh, also in Glasgow, when I was in Glasgow, I started work on the mid-span studies that uh, Victor Hawthorne had set up from in the, the mid-1960s and Charles Gillis had continued uh, um, running. And there's a whole series of these studies, you might know, you know, Paisley and Renfrew study, uh, perhaps there was a, a an occupational study which had got uh, rather a lot more data on socioeconomic factors, including uh, the occupation of the father of the uh, people in the study and the years of their years of education and le uh, age of leaving school and uh, uh, family set formation, number of siblings, and etc. So, which hadn't been used, so we, we had all those data entered and analysed, uh, and then uh, and we were then using those data to be able to look at how lifetime social position, you know, using your parental social class and, um, and then using also including area-based uh, measures and combining the area-based measures with life court, lifetime social position, demonstrating how these uh, contributed uh, together to inequalities in health. Um, and uh, um, and we, uh, not here, but there's a, uh, we also looked at the specific effects of childhood social class. And this was really interesting for um, thinking about the causes of the differences because uh, some conditions, in particular stomach cancer and hemorrhagic stroke, uh, were, were basically just associated with your childhood 
social status, if you could separate that from adulthood social status. This is going back to people born in the turn of the century, uh, remember. Uh, uh, and that sort of fits in with what's known of the etiology of stomach cancer, which has fallen over the sort of almost disappeared cancer, the body of the stomach over the 20th century. It's now mainly cardia uh, of the stomach cancer, which has different etiology. Uh, and um, uh, very likely due to the fall of Helicobacter pylori infection, which is acquired in childhood. A uh, number of the siblings the men had very strongly predicted stomach cancer and, he and uh, hemorrhagic stroke mortality. We hypothesized that hemorrhagic stroke, which is related, driven by blood uh, high blood pressure, uh, uh, that, that there might be effects of um, uh, childhood diarrheal disease on that, which we, we carried on working on. But uh, also uh, looking at uh, education uh, and, um, uh, and trying to see whether you could actually separate ed educational and then uh, occupational career trajectories uh, to, to determine how they came together to influence um, uh, health and uh, mortality risk. Uh, now, my uh, sort of interest in uh, inequalities in health, as uh, for many people, was uh, driven by the um, report of the what became known as the Black Report, uh, which was a, was a sort of foundational uh, in the discipline of area of studying health inequalities. Uh, came out uh, towards the end of my period as a medical student, uh, and um, as I say, uh, it really generated a, a much interest. Uh, probably it generated more interest because uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, government tried to suppress this report, which had been uh, commissioned under the out, under the uh, Callaghan Labour government, uh, but it. Uh, uh, in, in, in inconveniently appeared uh, during the kind of, um, early part of Thatcher's first period in office. Uh, and so they tried to uh, basically reduce its impact by only putting out a couple of hundred copies, which became now a collector's items and also releasing it on an Easter Monday. But that actually led to it getting more publicity. And uh, this, is, this is a group of people uh, who were responsible uh, for it. The second uh, on the left is Jerry Morris, who was my uh, MD supervisor and a, a Glaswegian uh, uh, by, uh, by, by origin. Um, and uh, the Black Report, uh, one of its innovations was that it uh, attempted to sort of form a causal framework for understanding the origins of health inequalities. Uh, and, uh, and, and there's been much descriptive work, but rather less work trying to have it, sort of give explanations. And uh, the explanations ranged at that time uh, from what they called the artifact explanation that maybe people got differently classed on, uh, on death certificates than in the census, and then you got, you know, you got enumerated denominator biases, which longitudinal studies uh, um, excluded as a, as a major explanation. Uh, so selection that it was uh, factors um, acting in early life which uh, influenced uh, both people's socioeconomic trajectory uh, and health trajectory uh, that there was behavioral and, um, and cultural factors that uh, contributed uh, or materialist what they refer to as materialist factors the sort of conditions of life uh, which of course also as they explained Discussed influenced um, you know, health related behaviors are influenced by material conditions of life. And with um, colleagues Mel Bartley and David Blaine from 1990 on, we spent a lot of time uh, uh, looking at these, examining these um, different um, explanations. Uh, in, in terms of what sort of came after the Black Report, again, in, interestingly, in it, when they were talking about the explanations, uh, they, they said that uh, it was their view that the two types of study were needed to go forward, a study of the interaction of social and environmental variables over time, so this notion of sort of life course, and they discuss, and uh, then they went on to discuss the relationship to the de healthy development of children. So they were very much thinking that um, early life influences uh, could, be, uh, could be important. So at the same time, uh, um, uh, in epidemiology, 
there were uh, many uh, sort of unanswered uh, questions of, of a more straightforward epidemiological nature. And one thing was that it was, uh, you know, really uh, these questions uh, were not getting robust uh, answers. Uh, and again, basically from, especially uh, from the late 1980s on, there were some very uh, disappointing uh, findings from randomized trials that have been established to test uh, hypotheses in particular around uh, uh, dietary antioxidants. So sort of vitamin Z, uh, E, vitamin C, um, beta carotene, et cetera. Huge randomized trials were set up and the epidemiological evidence appeared really robust that these things had you know, protected against cancer and cardiovascular disease. Observational studies suggested that you know, taking vitamin E supplements had a major effect in reducing the risk of mortality. And then these trials came along uh, testing exactly the same thing as, as was the exposure in the observational studies, such as you know, vitamin E supplements, taking vitamin E supplements, and failed to show uh, any benefit. Similar, the same thing was seen for hormone replacement therapy, et cetera. So I was, um, uh, and many others, concerned about um, uh, the ability to separate out uh, sort of causal factors when you, when you have a mesh of you know, highly correlated um, uh, exposures. So it was difficult to, you couldn't separate out the, the sort of vitamin E um, uh, as an exposure from many other factors. And so that, so you, if you looked in studies, you would show that vitamin E levels were lower in people who came from manual social class backgrounds, who uh, had less education, who smoked, who did less exercise, who had higher body mass index. Basically every unfavorable risk factor would go with it. Uh, but if you're actually trying to look for specific interventions um, that could actually improve health, you, you did need to sort of separate out what were the actual uh, causal uh, factors. Uh, and I had uh, uh, worked in the uh, uh, early in the 1980s um, uh, in, in the uh, Medical Research Council Epidemiology Unit in South Wales, and that, where, where they'd had two, they had two studies set up specifically to look at triglycerides and HDL cholesterol. That was a major hypothesis when the Caprilli study and the Speedwell study were set up which I um, spent a short amount of time have working on. Uh, so uh, of, of this sort of list of, uh, of uh, factors, which includes, you know, could alcohol protect against coronary heart disease, for example, uh, and this list of um, things which were, which were questions that were at the top of the list of questions to answer epidemiologically, uh, one was HDL cholesterol and uh, coronary heart disease. Uh, and with uh, Andy Phillips, who is a, a medical statistician, who was also in, in London who, when I was working at the School of Hygiene, who was uh, also interested in this area. Uh, we uh, <coughs> did some work based on the British Regional Heart Study, uh, where this conventional answer, which was that uh, if you did uh, a multivariable analysis, looking at with triglycerides and HDL cholesterol, seeing which one was the most important, in terms of uh, predicting and possibly being a causal factor for coronary heart disease, uh, the answer uh, by then that was generally agreed was that uh, uh, higher, higher HDL cholesterol was protective for uh, coronary heart disease and uh, triglyceride um, was, a, was a correlate, a bystander. Uh, and we showed that in the uh, British Regional Heart Study, uh, we, sh uh, we showed the same thing basically that uh, on, in the blue, you have the uh, just uh, single, single variable effects that triglyceride is, is associated with higher risk and HDL cholesterol with lower risk. Uh, on the right, I've just split the chart because it's um, easier than to, to see rather than one going down and one going up. And then if you did the mutual adjustment, HDL cholesterol effects seem much more robust. Uh, but uh, when taking um, you know, blood samples for, for studies, especially you know, early in the morning in, uh, uh, in South Wales, uh, um, you, um, you didn't need really much, sort of, uh, a lot of um, uh, processing of the blood samples because, uh, once you'd spun them down, because you could often see you know, cloudy uh, serum reflecting uh, you know, uh, high, 
high triglycerides. And it, was, it couldn't really see it that, you know, <laughs> you couldn't give her answers to it. But, uh, but the point was that triglycerides are enormously uh, responsive. So if someone had a, a, a few pints of Guinness late at night and then was getting up early in the morning when the samples were taken, you, you know, their triglyceride levels would be much higher than uh, someone who hadn't eaten from uh, seven o'clock when going to bed. And so there's clearly vastly more variability in triglycerides than HDL. So we then sort of modeled this uh, of saying, well, let's imagine this, uh, this greater measurement error as it is uh, when it changes over time, it can either be real changes or just because you're measuring things worse with, eight, with triglycerides, it's definitely ch it's changing to a large extent. Uh, and uh, therefore we, 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 we took a sort of intra-class correlation, which is like taking two measures, say a week apart, for example, for triglycerides and HDL. Uh, and uh, if you imagine, if you thought that was about 0.7 for triglycerides, 0.9 for HDL, then if you, if you corrected for that measurement error, both of the uh, univariable effects became larger so in, in the red column, and then mutually correcting the HDL effect was still uh, larger if you, if, with that assumption. But if you just change that to 0.6, which, and you couldn't classify it in that way at all. There's no studies that would allow you to classify it that well. And you don't know, you know what component of a changing variable might be important. It might be the peak that's important. It might be the long-term average, et cetera. Uh, then you got the reverse answer. So, so this was not, not just not stable, it just would flip. Uh, uh, and then if you just then change one, one from 0.9 to 0.95, it flipped back again. So this was really rather concerning about the uh, ability to do um, uh, to actually separate out these correlated uh, factors when trying to uh, identify causes. And in fact, I gave up a PhD I started doing on fibrinogen job stress and coronary heart disease because uh, if, if I did this sort of analysis, it looked basically unanswerable. But, uh, uh, but you know, studies just carried on being done suggesting that HDL cholesterol uh, was protective. This was a large pooling. Uh, project showing the same results, HDL effects much uh, more stable. This is even 2009 saying the current findings suggest that therapy directed at HDL cholesterol uh, may generate substantial additional benefits. Of course, of claims are made and literally billions of dollars were invested in drugs which lower, which raised HDL uh, cholesterol uh, with uh, the, the ultimate uh, finding that uh, uh, that was not uh, actually uh, beneficial. There's just no benefit at all of raising HDL cholesterol, uh, however much money you spent on it. Um, so that's sort of demonstrating the problem with uh, causal analysis. Now I think uh, I think this went round uh, uh, with a YouTube video to try and get people to watch a, a YouTube video on Mendelian randomization because I'm now going to very briefly explain uh, Mendelian randomization. So hopefully some of you uh, saw that. Um, so um, in, in observational epidemiology, it's very difficult to identify a modifiable exposure. Uh, I mean, you can have obviously confounding, many factors can influence both your exposure and your outcome and therefore generate a non-causal association. Uh, probably one of the most uh, difficult to remove uh, uh, effects is when you have reverse causation, when the early stages of disease like atherosclerosis uh, influence um, your exposure. Uh, but um, in Mendelian randomization, you take a genetic variant, because you know, genetic variants are essentially sort of uh, randomly distributed uh, at uh, conception. Uh, you take a genetic variant which, in, which is related to an on average difference in your exposure. But obviously the genetic variant cannot be influenced by any confounders or your germline variant, what you bought, what you uh, got, you get at conception and nor can reverse causation influence it and can't be conventional confounding. So when you relate <coughs> that um, uh, variable which, uh, which, is, which uh, indexes a higher average level of exposure uh, with the outcome that will not uh, suffer from confounding or reverse causation which allows you to be more confident that the uh, association between uh, exposure and outcome uh, is causal. Uh, and a second assumption, an interpretive assumption then, if you're going to use that for to think about interventions that needs to be made, uh, is that 
the, the, there will be the same downstream effect of the modifiable exposure, the cholesterol, whether it's influenced by a genetic variant or it's influenced by you know, modifiable uh, um, influences like diet or cholesterol or medication, etc. Now for cholesterol, that's fairly straightforward, seeing as that, that when looking at the um, genetic um, the genes uh, that are related uh, to cholesterol level, they are in, for example, HMG reductase, which is the target of statins, or uh, PCSK9, which is the target of PCSK9 inhibitors. These are all drugs that have been used in massive randomized trials and definitely reduce the risk of coronary heart disease or a protein called neiman pick c one like one protein, which is a, a transporter of cholesterol uh, across the gut. So that might sort of mimic dietary, dietary uh, intake to an extent. So, um, so, so that notion of sort of G, that, that you get equivalent outcomes <coughs> if your exposure is modified is, or is influenced by genes and by environment is one that always needs to be uh, considered. But if, you, if that is a reasonable <coughs> interpretation, uh, then that, that would, that would uh, strengthen your, um, yeah, your, your assumptions or your, your, your conclusions. So, um, uh, so then going to, the, uh, go, no, going to this more uh, formally, um, uh, we, you have your genetic uh, variant and if your genetic, uh, your genetic variant uh, has to be related to your exposure. So, it's, and that's called the relevance assumption, and you can test that statistically. Uh, but then you have to think that your genetic variant <coughs> is not confounded. Now, for, com for confounding, a confounder has to be something which influences both your exposure and your outcome. So, for a genetic variant to be confounded, it can't obviously be the variant itself. All it can be is the distribution of the variant uh, that, that might, there might be a distributional confounding. And the, the basic, the, basically the um, two factors that could potentially do that are ancestry, um, which will influence the distribution of your variants, it might influence the distribution of your outcome, um, uh, and which in genetic studies <coughs> uh, can be addressed by uh, adjusting for principal components of data from across the genome. Uh, that relate to ancestry, or it could be selection bias if your genetic variant influences something which in, which in turn influences whether you participate in studies, that can actually lead to dist distributional um, uh, differences. So you need to consider uh, those. But the, probably the, the main assumption uh, is that uh, the genetic variant is independent of your outcome, except uh, through an effect uh, on your exposure of interest. So for example, your genetic variant related to cholesterol level would not influence coronary heart disease <coughs> if it wasn't that it had an effect uh, on, um, uh, on cholesterol level. Now, you, uh, you can't, um, uh, you can't, you can't uh, test that uh, by adjustment, which I think I'll come on to uh, later by adjusting for the, uh, for the intermediate variable. And uh, Mendelian randomization studies um, uh, that, that, had been, uh, that had been carried out uh, brought very bad sort of bad news on, uh, on some things. Uh, in particular, uh, the, uh, I said in the 1980s, there was lots of discussion and work on alcohol and cardiovascular disease uh, and uh, indeed uh, uh, alcohol was considered to be protective uh, of uh, coronary heart disease uh, and maybe some other cardiovascular diseases. The uh, really bad news is this bottle of beer, which uh, I took a photo of when I was, it was in Glasgow. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, old mortality is sadly the truth is that alcohol uh, increases risk of all cause mortality and doesn't have a protective effect on coronary heart disease. That was um, all due to uh, confounding. Uh, and Mendelian randomization <coughs> also showed uh, from the um, um, mid 2000s, 2005, 2006, that HDL cholesterol it, uh, said HDL cholesterol would not be protective of coronary heart disease, which the very expensive randomized trials uh, then then did indeed show. So as I was, so um, so with um, 
uh, education, the, the, the genome-wide association studies uh, were done, uh, and uh, a large number of genetic variants uh, identified that uh, relate to uh, education. Now, when you have a large number of genetic variants uh, uh, relating to something, as you do to HDL cholesterol, et cetera, et cetera, there is a whole host of um, sensitivity analyses you can do because you can compare the effects of the different variants. And if you think that some of them might be, uh, might be showing bias because of biotropic effects, et cetera, uh, then you would see a, a large spread in the effects or maybe different uh, clusters uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, predicted effects. Uh, for example, if some of them are working through one mechanism and some through another, and you can test, you can look at all of those with uh, heterogeneity statistics overall, but then there's a whole host of, uh, of um, methods, uh, probably the, um, the first one uh, that became widely used is known as mr Egger, and then there's weighted median modal estimates. Uh, there's one called MR Genius now. There's, there's, there's a very large number of, of sensitivity analyses, which means you can see uh, are the results uh, are the results you're finding using those uh, using multiple genetic variants uh, um, uh, how uh, susceptible they are to varying the uh, to varying the inclusion criteria uh, and um, and varying the assumptions about the plausibility uh, of the instruments so so um, these uh, MR study, Mendelian randomization studies which uh, which utilize genetic variants related to, uh, uh, to, uh, to education uh, have generally been done uh, with around uh, with 74 variants that were, the, that were first identified because that was done outside of a study called UK Biobank, which is half a million uh, people, uh, including me, who's been followed up for a long period of time and is the sort of largest study of its type that people can access. Uh, and uh, you don't want to generate your instruments in the same data set that you uh, test them in. So this study here, uh, done by Dan uh, Rossoff, um, utilized these, uh, these variants uh, and then it, and it combined the estimates using 74 and it did all the sensitivity analyses I've mentioned and these effects, these were uh, robust to, uh, to those. Uh, and it looked at uh, uh, education and uh, various alcohol uh, outcomes, I mentioned alcohol uh, earlier, uh, and um, what it found uh, was that uh, education, uh, 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 if you predict education with the genetic variants, that then it was uh, protective against the alcohol dependence uh, and, um, uh, and was protective against one of the audit questions that was used in Biobank on memory loss during uh, uh, drinking episodes. Uh, in Mendelian randomization, you could also uh, uh, do a sort of uh, a sort of sanity check by uh, looking in the reverse direction. Now, educational attainment is unlikely to be uh, that strongly uh, influenced by you know alcohol consumption because uh, it, it stops in relatively uh, early life. Uh, but if you but if you there are of course a lot of uh, variants uh, that relate to this, which are the ones which show that alcohol isn't protective against coronary heart disease, isn't. Uh, doesn't isn't protective against mortality, and that, but it does increase HDL cholesterol, and it does uh, have effects on blood pressure, puts your blood pressure up, etc. All the things we know from trials, the Mendelian randomization studies on alcohol consumption uh, show. Um, uh, but what this shows is that if you, if you do the sanity check, then you're not showing you're not showing uh, uh, any robust effects of uh, any of the alcohol uh, variables on educational attainment, so the direction of effect is from education to uh, alcohol. Uh, and then uh, if you look at uh, total alcohol consumption, for example, then uh, educational attainment, attainment uh, uh, years of schooling, uh, years of education was used in something one of the, the, main, the GWAS used here, but other, other outcomes have been looked at uh, in, uh, in these studies. Uh, it didn't relate to total uh, drinks per week, but it did relate to less reports of binge drinking, uh, less reports of, of, of single sessions with a large number of drinks, uh, and it, uh, it, it related positively to drinking frequency, 
So that makes sense. So people, uh, higher educational attainment people, uh, people with higher, uh, higher educational attainment were drinking more frequently, but had less total drinks per occasion and less binge drinking episodes. Uh, and it relates to uh, drinking alcohol with meals. And uh, uh, as one's, uh, uh, um, as one might presuppose, uh, educational attainment was related to higher wine consumption and lower beer uh, consumption. So, <coughs> um, so studies have been done looking at, uh, so that's just looking at one risk factor. You do, there's been many now detailed studies uh, using uh, other, uh, looking at a whole host of factors that might uh, influence the disease outcomes such as BMI, uh, blood pressure, smoking behaviours, uh, and um, one advantage of Mendelian randomization uh, is that in observational studies, I talked about measurement error earlier on, you obviously underestimate when you have um, uh, measurement error in exposure, like education, which you'll have, you underestimate effects, and Mendelian randomization tends to show larger effects uh, of, um, uh, of educational attainment on, for example, lower BMI, lower blood pressure, less smoking than just the um, uh, than just the observational associations. This is uh, Alice Carter's uh, work from uh, Bristol. Uh, again, as I say, many, many things have now been looked at in this way. Uh, um, this is um, educational attainment has, has been very strongly associated with a higher le level of myopia. This is from UK Biobank. This is the observational data showing that the age completed full-time education, the, the longer you stayed in education, the more likely you were, be to, were to be short-sighted. And this was actually with eye tests in the UK. Um, Biobank, uh, so which way around does that go? Um, so if you, of course, if you do the observation analysis, you can't, you can't tell which way is it myopia ends up, uh, improves educational attainment because people don't go out uh, uh, as much and spend more time or they, uh, 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 or uh, is it uh, that uh, it's a factor like you know people doing more reading influences uh, um, and being indoors influences uh, myopia, but also drives educational attainment. Uh, and uh, uh, um, Ed Mountjoy uh, uh, looked at this uh, in Biobank, and uh, when doing the Mendelian randomization analysis, it looked like liability to longer to uh, more edu to higher education attainment uh, was associated uh, with uh, reduced um, for, with um, with factor of error, whereas if you do it the other way around, if you look at people's uh, uh, indicators of myopia um, uh, themselves, uh, they weren't uh, influencing educational attainment. So it seems to be that, that it's the sort of practice of uh, you know education attainment will go with reading more, being inside more, etc and other things which uh, drive this. Uh, and in fact, the, the, there have been uh, now a few, a few trials done, that's just summarizing these results, a few trials done such as this one, where they're actually uh, during the, um, during the uh, educational uh, period, uh, part of people's lives, they are actually randomizing to spending uh, time outdoors um, uh, to try and reduce uh, the, uh, this effect, which, uh, this trial successfully done, and there's some large trials uh, ongoing. Uh, then, if you look at disease outcomes, uh, what you see in the observational studies, what we saw in our 1998 study that higher educational attainment is reduced with, is associated with a reduced risk of coronary events. You, know, you see, uh, uh, and all, and you see um, that uh, the educational. Uh, uh, sorry, and, that, and then this is uh, now comparing the observational effect shown that the, to, with the MR effect shown that the MR effects uh, are larger. So I mentioned uh, triangulation, uh, uh, looking at which means just using other methods which might all be biased, but for which the bias is unlikely to go in the same direction uh, as would a Mendelian randomization study. So for example, the, uh, the myopia education um, study, uh, there's, there's a randomized uh, trial uh, for an intervention uh, sort of based on, uh, on, on that sort of knowledge. Uh, 
uh, together with an MR study. Uh, in UK, Biobank, Neil Davis uh, 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 used the, when the school leaving age uh, is raised uh, and uh, uh, as, a, as an indicator of trying to see how, what the causal effects of education were, because of course that, the school leaving age was raised just at one particular uh, time. And it was be sort of luck whether you were born, you know, one or two years, one side of it, or one or two years, the um, other side of it, other side of that uh, change. Um, and so, and this will of course change educational attainment in a very different way, or you know, number of years spent in education in a very different way than genetic variants will, because it was basically stopping uh, kids leaving school at 15. I was born just after the year after that, and if anyone at that time had told me that uh, the kids in the year above me uh, who had to, who wanted to leave school but didn't weren't allowed, couldn't uh, it would be it would have beneficial effects for uh, for anyone I would have probably doubted that I thought probably the sole reason for this uh, law being uh, this change occurring was that was so there'd be enough kids to beat me up in the year above but, but um, the remarkable thing is that this change produced. Uh, that you can show that this change produced effects on a whole host of outcomes. So you're just simply looking about whether someone, you know, someone was born either side of uh, September uh, in, uh, in, uh, at the time that this change came in. And you do a regression displacement analysis, just taking, uh, you know, from a few years uh, from either side uh, and uh, look to see whether that there was a displacement at that at the point when people had when people couldn't leave school. Uh, at that um, uh, at 15 uh, and uh, what's shown is that uh, here we see in uh, in red is the uh, actual years of education uh, in blue are the MR analyses and in green is the policy reform analyses so you see for things like smoking and uh, 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 and uh, um, income you might imagine education increases uh, income these, these estimates are in the same direction and uh, often uh, are quite close. There's one exception, which I think is on the next <coughs> slide, which is intriguing, which was, um, uh, was blood pressure. Uh, but uh, otherwise, the <coughs> otherwise, the two methods uh, came to, uh, pointed in the same direction uh, in terms of the outcomes. And, uh, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, here, this was the you could you can you can then use uh, Mendelian randomization uh, to look at the extent uh, to which the differences in coronary heart disease outcomes are, are explained by the uh, risk factors um, which are uh, which 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 education influences and they and uh, together the they the. the BMI, blood pressure, smoking, contribute about 40%, uh, uh, even the BMR estimates, which don't have measurement error, but still it's a major, con is a major contribution. Now I'm gonna skip very, very quickly, skip, skip through these, uh, these uh, PowerPoints, but what they're, what they're just showing is you can, you can use Mendelian randomization to look at a whole host of risk factors, and it's called multivariable Mendelian randomization, when genetic variants that predict any of them, which are reliable predictors of any of them are included, uh, and their effects on the two, on, on, I'll start with two, on the two factors uh, uh, are taken into account. Now, it could be that you, you could have a sort of confounding model that um, uh, that uh, one exposure then, uh, one exposure influ uh, influences both the other exposure uh, and the outcome, and, the, and multivariable MR will sort this out. Probably the most, the thing which is uh, very, very difficult to, deal with in observational studies is this idea uh, of a collider and the collider is a variable that uh, if you uh, if you adjust for it or you take it into account it might be when you have to take into account but if you actually uh, take it into account as measured uh, it uh, leads to it can lead to greater confounding greater bias for other variables and uh, that's probably best it's easiest to explain that by thinking uh, of states, imagine that in the general population that attractiveness and acting talent are, are not associated. So just imagine they're unassociated in the general population. But then you see whether people have got Hollywood 
uh, acting career. And then you just you, you adjust for or you stratify by that. That has the same effect uh, statistically. So you, can, you just look in the strata of people who've become actors, uh, for example. And remember, attractiveness and acting talent. We're imagining they're not correlated. But what? But if you look at uh, if, if you look just at people who become Hollywood actors, of course, the ones who are who aren't very good at acting are are going to they've got there somehow. They're going to be more you know they're going to be more attractive. Now I know we can all think of the outliers. You know the, the ugly bad actors, but, um, but you, will, you will get a, you will, even though there's no association in the overall data, you get an association uh, uh, in the data once you stratify by that variable. So, uh, and as I say, statistically adjusting for this has the same effect. And this is why conventional mediation analyses, for example, uh, when you adjust for a mediator, you, you have, have two major problems. One is that you have measurement error in the mediator, which will leave a residual effect, even if it fully explains the um, the outcome which Mendelian randomization deals with because it's because it's automatically corrected for measurement error because the genetic variant relates to exposure over um, uh, over life uh, and the second thing is that if you if you're if you're doing this with the measured variables like measured attractiveness measured uh, uh, acting ability and you and you adjust for and you adjust for whether someone's an actor or whatever uh, for the measured things then um, this introduces this collider bias, which isn't introduced uh, if you um, uh, 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 if you use the genetically predicted effects in uh, MR. And this is a paper by well, it's been published ages ago uh, in in uh, 2019 from Alan Sanderson, which goes through this and uh, with a whole host of uh, um, uh, simulations. Uh, and as an example, looked at um, cognitive ability and education on smoking. So you could have you could have a model where educational attainment influences cognitive ability. You could have a model where cognitive ability influences uh, edu uh, uh, educational attainment, and then you can look at their effects on uh, smoking. Uh, and uh, in the because these educational attainment and cognitive ability are highly correlated uh, in the just the simple uh, univariable analyses, uh, both of them in, in the single variable MR, both of them uh, uh, predicted uh, that. Uh, uh, later age completed completed education, higher uh, general cognitive ability related to less smoking, but in the multivariable Mendelian randomization, the effect was entirely uh, due to uh, educational attainment. Uh, and this has been this is done for a variety of smoking outcomes. So uh, that uh, seems to be the model. It's the, the it's yeah the, that it's the educational attainment which is related to less smoking. And as we showed. It's related strongly to uh, less uh, smoking, and in fact, uh, this, a similar thing applies to looking to uh, looking at uh, liability to suicide attempts as the uh, outcome. Now, you're obviously interested in studying uh, mediation uh, because if you if you identify intermediate variables which are causal, you can intervene at that level. It allows you to understand how intervention. Uh, uh, how, how the intervention works and identifies opportunities for intervention. Um, as I said, adjusting for the intermediate variable uh, uh, is problematic because of measurement error and because of collider bias. Because if other uh, educational attainment uh, will become associated with other factors that relate with, to BMI, when you adjust for BMI, as, as trying to look at BMI as a mediator, so you will actually distort uh, your uh, estimates. So, uh, so. Uh, so this is the answer, the result, I shouldn't have shown it earlier. This is, <laughs> this is the slide that I should have removed from being earlier on the uh, uh, proportion of explained using that form of uh, using multivariable Mendelian randomization uh, to uh, estimate the remaining direct effects of, uh, of uh, education and using a two, and using two step um, MR of, uh, uh, of the intermediate variables uh, on the uh, outcomes. Uh, and I'll do one minute left and then I'll stop. Uh, so uh, this, is, this was just a sort of uh, uh, issues, that, uh, sort of remaining issue. I talked about population uh, structure. So people uh, being of different ancestries, for example, uh, uh, that would actually uh, distort, might distort associations between the genetic variants and the outcome. And the sort of usual example of this is uh, there's a genetic variant used in studies of alcohol, uh, acetal acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, uh, 
which is, is uh, prevalent in uh, East Asian populations, but has essentially zero in long-term European origin uh, groups. Uh, and, but if you have a sort of mixed population and you don't take account of ancestry, that genetic variant will appear to sort of influence uh, chopstick use. So, so, um, uh, so, so this needs to be taken into account. Uh, and, uh, and one way of doing that, of course, is to look between siblings because they have, this, they have the, set, the, the same parents and they cannot be, they, they're, they're the diff their difference in, in uh, genetic variation is rather more truly uh, random what they, what they, what, what they, uh, how they differ. So um, a lot of effort is going on in get, trying to put together large collections uh, of, uh, sibling, uh, of siblings for doing these, these, these sorts of studies. And uh, some findings, some early findings using Mendelian randomization on education, for example, suggesting BMI, higher BMI was, might, might lead to lower final educational attainment and greater height to uh, longer years in school. When you actually do the between sibling analyses, those effects uh, reduced essentially become essentially zero. Uh, and uh, an issue we're uh, particularly uh, interested in, uh, referred to as dynastic effects, and this is using the non transmitted al uh, alleles from parents uh, as a way of, uh, of, of looking at uh, or examining the effects of the family level environment. Because on this slide here, if you think, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, for each individual, they'll get 50% of the variance from the mum, 50% of the variance from the dad, which means there's 50% of the variance uh, that the, the mother has that are not transmitted to the, um, to the offspring. And this is rather beautiful because it allows you to separate out the effects that the, that maternal and paternal education in this example because that's what I'm talking about uh, has uh, on the offspring uh, which are which are through the fact that they pass on genes and the effect which is due to the environment for the, because because the genes they that aren't passed on uh, obviously uh, not having a that the uh, offspring do not carry those uh, 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 and they must be if they if they are shown to have an influence then that influence must be through the environment uh, provided and uh, for education, this has been shown to be a large, effect, uh, a large effect. Uh, the uh, between sibling uh, um, effect of of the genetic variance on education is about half of the of what you see in the general population. So it's suggesting that um, that a, a, a chunk of this is provided um, by um, by the environment provided, and you can use this to to study things like how much does having parents have smoked. Uh, influence whether offspring smoke and how much is the, is the fact that there are some genetic variants that relate very highly to heaviness of smoking like CHRNA5, you know, strong effects uh, how much, uh, to, to be able to actually, to, to be able to uh, separate, um, uh, to be able to separate those out. So, so these family-based studies uh, are, are only just starting really to, to be used and to, uh, to be done and appear because large enough samples exist. And you can use uh, Mendelian randomization to study social processes such as assortative mating, and you demonstrate that that is through uh, phenotype. You get assortative mating by height and by education. You get assortative mating by uh, you know alcohol consumption, and in, and you can actually recapitulate the phen the as measured effects um, using genetic variants to demonstrates that it is actually the phenotype uh, rather than uh, social economy, et cetera, that is uh, driving uh, is driving that. So just to finish, just to say quasi-experimental designs can strengthen causal inference, that uh, triangulating the evidence from different approaches uh, is, it can be powerful. And uh, let's say uh, other studies of uh, <coughs> school leaving age of, of, of different you know, changes in, in uh, legislation uh, and practice uh, uh, have been used in, in, in this way. Uh, although uh, one uh, issue is that uh, it might need to sort of focus on what can be addressed by causal inference methods like this uh, and then that becomes a popular target for investigation because you can do it and you, know, hope, and you think you might be able to get sensible causal 
uh, cause lancers. As I say, it's, you know, it's, as an epidemiologist, it was, it's been extremely depressing how uh, so many things that appeared so promising epidemiologically uh, turned out not to be when they were actually uh, put into interventions. But obviously, in terms of uh, policies, etc., you don't want to be just uh, driven by what can be studied by a particular method. So uh, that's it. And these are the uh, people who um, did the work that I uh, presented. And uh, that's it. Oh, there's a further reading slide, but it hasn't got anything on it. So <laughs> thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, George. That's absolutely fascinating, particularly for someone like me who's not, it's not really my area. Uh, but I feel I've started to understand Mendelian randomization a, a little bit more and, and its power. Um, so we have some questions. I think we've got a couple on the yeah. chat box and then some in the Q&A box as well. So if we take the chat box first and then have other questions put ah. into the Q&A box, if that's okay. Okay, so the, let me uh, have to find them. Uh, uh, the where's, the chat, where's the chat box? Can't see the chat. Uh, it's, it's just in the middle, uh, the bottom of the screen in the middle. I can read out the tiles if you want. Yeah, I can, I can see Q&A, but I can't see the chat box. Okay, okay so well, I'll read out a couple from the, the chat box first, and then if we go on to the, the Q&A. So, oh, uh, I found it. I found the chat box. <laughs> okay. You can see how right, bad cool. I am at this. Uh, for the alcohol MRs, I've heard some people argue that cardiovascular protective effects are limited to some age sex groups, e.g. Uh, middle-aged women. Uh, yeah, no, that's, a, that's uh, a, a good question. So the most, uh, the sort of the most powerful um, studies uh, have been done, uh, sadly, in populations where and mainly they answer very powerfully the questions about males because um, East Asian populations, uh, uh, the, there's a, this genetic variant I mentioned, the uh, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase uh, variant has a huge effect on drinking because this is a variant that, you know, when you drink alcohol, uh, uh, it's metabolized uh, from alcohol to acetaldehyde, uh, acetaldehyde gives you all the bad effects of alcohol, palpitations, you know, headache, flushing, guilt, actually not guilt, but it gives you all the other bad, out, bad effects. And, uh, and if you're homozygous, if you have two copies of that variant, people literally drink uh, with uh, hardly any documented drinking because it, alcohol becomes it's very unpleasant. If you have one copy, you drink, then people drink intermediate amounts and uh, no copies, uh, then, then especially males in East Asian populations have data. There's, you know, there's quite high levels of drinking, but uh, but traditionally in, uh, in those um, uh, places, uh, women have, have drunk rather little, except in now in South Korea, in, now that's changing, especially in, in South Korea and some others. But that means that the data we have are largely on males, and in males you can show in different age groups um, the, uh, the the same. Uh, the effects are sadly adverse uh, acr uh, across uh, age groups you can go down to for cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, in, in women, you can just about show that overall, uh, you can just about show overall it's ad uh, adverse, but the, but the effects on the potential um, mediators, um, in particular blood pressure, are definitely the same in women and men. You have large enough numbers with continuous outcomes to show they're the same. So we need um, much bigger samples, but then you can then address, you can look in, in subsamples, especially uh, when those subsamples are, are by exogenous variables like age and sex, uh, things which aren't influenced by the genetic variants uh, outside the X chromosome that people are carrying, uh, you can do those analyses uh, uh, very easily. And the next one, uh, uh, what do I think would think be a minimum threshold in a QTL for the proportion of variants explained in any trait to be eligible? So that's, a, that's a, 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 a interesting and a, a, that's an important uh, question. Um, I think there's not, there's not like uh, uh, a, a, a um, sort of threshold that you would say. Uh, it uh, depends on sample size. So the, the, uh, so the sort of one potential bias in, in any instrumental variables analysis is 
um, called weak instrument bias, and that's, that is a statistical, uh, that depends on your sort of statistical level uh, of, uh, of certainty that the variant relates to the exposure. And so just by magnifying up your effect size, something that might be a weak instrument in a small study is, is perfectly strong in a large study. Um, uh, for, um, uh, I think when people look at these variances, because the variants explained in MR in, in, with genetic variants are, are quite small, they sometimes uh, maybe don't uh, put that next to what you see in, a, in, a, in randomized trials, uh, because those results aren't reported in terms of variants. So if you consider, so C-reactive protein, which was probably this sort of pinup of Mendelian randomization, because uh, drug companies would, were developing drugs that would lower C-reactive protein, all the epidemiological evidence looked great that it was uh, strongly predicted coronary heart disease. There was a lot of, a lot, many people thought that this was causal, but many of randomizations showed not, but um, uh, and the trials, you know, the, the drug development stopped. Uh, the, there's a genetic variant in the promoter region of CR, of that, that, of, which explains uh, about 1.25% of the variants or something. But uh, of CRP, but if you take a randomized trial, say blood pressure lowering tablets, and you know, take a large group of uh, people, you divide them into two groups, you give them a tablet which lowers blood pressure by, uh, by um, the, the amount that these tablets lower blood pressure. The, the, the fact of being a blood pressure tablet uh, explains about the same percentage of the variance in blood pressure in the population. So, um, uh, um, so that's why you need, you know, you need big, big studies in randomized controlled trials I don't think there is a, a minimum uh, threshold, uh, um, and, uh, but, uh, but especially when you need, uh, when you want to have uh, multiple variants to uh, allow all these, um, uh, these tests of, uh, of whether you've been, but there's uh, strong evidence of being biased by pleiotropy doing a whole series of sensitivity analyses then you, need a re then, then you need a reasonable number of variables of, of uh, genetic variants that relate, uh, which aren't weak instruments. Uh, and when you do a multivariable MR, as Eleanor Sanderson and Jack Bowden have just put a paper on BioArchive, uh, it, you can't just use your first stage F statistic for those to, to, to do these sorts of studies. You need to look at a multivariable uh, the multivariable uh, F statistic, uh, and those are those become uh, uh, reduced as you put more variants into it that relate to the same phenotype into the model. So you need to be very careful that you're not falling into instrumental variable, uh, into weak instrument bias. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of give thresholds for this. Okay. Can I Thanks, stop sharing my? Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. So we've got yeah. There's, there's there you go. I've stopped. I've stopped sharing. Two questions here in the Q and A. So if we just if we could yeah. look through those Sorry. ones, and we'll probably leave it at that. I think if anyone else have any questions, maybe pick up of offline uh, at some point. Yeah, um, no, I'm very yeah, I'm very happy to. So we've got one yeah, from Claire um, about apart from further increasing the school leaving age, she asked what intervention, in your opinion, might reduce health inequalities. Yeah, well, I, well, I think uh, uh, the higher level uh, interventions, uh, you know, like uh, uh, you know, uh, positive taxation, for example, uh, are likely to are very likely to reduce uh, health inequalities. I mean, we're never going to get Mendelian <laughs> randomization data on that. Uh, I mean, there are analyses which have tried to use, you know, things like changes in the, in in those rates. Uh, in taxation rates um, to, uh, as ways of getting estimates, but uh, of which there's a sort of uh, a battle in uh, economics uh, in econometrics about the results of those. I mean, I think I think um, there's obviously that in many situations you have to have sort of balance of evidence, uh, make out balance of evidence uh, decisions. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, you know many such interventions in, in this area. Are never aren't going to be uh, uh, aren't going to be uh, instantly informable by sort of improved causal inference methods. But um, so it's, it's a pity, but we don't really have that much evidence. <laughs> you know, I don't think we don't have that. I think 
um, policy, policy is not particularly strongly informed by uh, evidence anyway. So. <laughs> yes. Um, so we've got a couple of quite technical questions about um, the, pro the approaches of, of, of MR and then I'll pick up, I think, in Lawrence's question at the end. So I don't know if you want to address Mark Bailey's first, George. Uh, better for doing MR. Polygenic risk scores. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think using the... Uh, so yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, uh, I think there's, there's uh, um, I think using poly, just single polygenic scores, uh, uh, which were well powered, was really something that was used uh, when you were sort of at the margins of, of power with sample sizes. But now with very large studies, uh, you can use the individual variants, which allows you to do the whole set, set of sensitivity analyses. But I think the second part uh, is, 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 uh, is a very good point and something which there's a lot of work going on at the moment about. Um, and, and, that, the, and that is really that um, once you set, really get massive, massive samples, then, then when you do uh, your genome-wide association studies, you essentially uh, Recapitulate um, confounding because uh, you because uh, you start picking up genetic variants which influence uh, one factor which then in turn influences your ex your exposure. So, for example, to take CRP as an example, uh, uh, when you did when the ge genome wide association studies of C-reactive protein got got larger and larger, you know you, your initial hit. Were, were variants um, in LD in the CRP gene, and they they're rather plausible as being variants that uh, are influencing CRP level um, in a way which isn't it might not have uh, pleiotropic effects. But then, uh, as you go down the list, you start getting FTO, which was the first gene genetic variant found related to BMI. Is it becomes a sort becomes you know genome wide significant for CRP, and if you didn't know that it was uh, if you didn't know that it influenced BMI, you think you might think, well, that will use that as one of the instruments. And then, of course, uh, uh, if you're using that as an instrument for CRP, uh, it would actually any effect of body mass index on your outcome might appear to be a CRP effect. So, uh, so to be, so for that, um, if, if you can use um, bidirectional Mendelian randomization, doing Mendelian randomization in both directions, and also you can use a um, method called, uh, which is called you know, Steiger filtering, which is just essentially saying uh, you would, uh, if, uh, that your genetic variant should have a greater effect on the variance of your exposure than your outcome. And you might be using this, a pseudo variance for one of those uh, two things. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, it should have a dramatically, it should have a rather a, you know, quite substantially uh, greater effect. So you look through all your variants that you're using as variants for CRP, uh, and and then and you look at a whole range of uh, potential factors that might be influencing CRP, and you might be um, uh, mistaking or, or using as a CRP instrument. And if you do that, that filtering, uh, do these variants explain more of the variants in CRP than any other potential uh, um, factor that's underlying the CRP level? Uh, then, uh, then that then uh, that that might lead that would uh, select out variants like FTO, et etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so that can be done, and that's being sort of tested. Uh, the, the best ways of doing that is is uh, is, is being looked at uh, quite extensively uh, at present. So, but but at the bottom line is, if I was doing an M doing randomization study of CRP, I would. Mainly, my main analysis would be just using CRP for motor use region variant, uh, which is uh, you know, much more plausibly a clean uh, instrument. And uh, you, where you can, I, I've not seen this formally demonstrated, but where you can just see that it, it, it would definitely, it is definitely a problem, uh, is for example, um, and doing randomization studies of vitamin D. Uh, and uh, uh, initial ones that were done used four variants, which are very, which are in the pathway, which really leads to uh, vitamin D um, uh, synthesis. Uh, and those variants 
um, when used, they, they suggest that vitamin D has a protective effect on multiple sclerosis. But all the other observational effects, you know, as, is, as was the case with all these other anti with, with the antioxidant vitamins, vitamin D has been said to protect against everything. It suggested that most of those uh, uh, are non-causal, which certainly is now some trial, but there's some trial evidence uh, that that's the case. Uh, but if you look at the latest vitamin D uh, GWAS, which was in Nature Communications uh, recently, and they don't really do MR of it, but they do genetic correlations and some other analyses that show this, is that you know variants related to education relate to higher, you know, to different levels of vitamin D. Uh, variants related to BMI higher BMI relate to lower levels of vitamin D, etc. And if you if you used all those variants as vitamin D uh, uh, instruments without doing this form of uh, extensive uh, filtering, Steiger filtering, uh, you would get the wrong answer. So um, yeah, so so I so I it, so I think it, it you would definitely do a series of analyses. Or I would uh, prioritizing the uh, instruments that are uh, that, that 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 are sort of clean or, or appear likely to be uh, plausible instruments. So I'm conscious of of time. Um, it's easy to forget when we're in our own places Sorry. that there might be other things uh, going on as well. So can I just finish off with Lawrence uh, Moore's question when he's asked, are there other socioeconomic yeah, influences other than education where Mendelian randomization has been obvious? Yeah, that's a that's a um, that's a very good question. Uh, I would uh, I, I I would say that at present, I don't think anyone I don't think there's been any demonstration uh, of uh, uh, of this uh, uh, being in this, uh, you know, of of there being able to be um, such analyses uh, that that one would uh, treat as being uh, reliable. Uh, you know, people have tried to, there have been attempts at doing work on things like income, et cetera, but uh, um, uh, I've, not, I've not been uh, convinced uh, by uh, any of that. Um, I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think one would never, sort of like never say never, but, uh, but, but at present, I think really education is, 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 the, is, is the socioeconomic uh, factor. Uh, which is is most uh, you know you're most able to do such work. Okay, so I think we'll stop at that. Um, kind of rounds of applause, I guess. Unfortunately, <laughs> virtual <laughs> setting. That's fine. But just Some to to idea. thank George very much for his time. To thank Audrey Dickey uh, for organising uh, the webinar approach. I think it's working really well. And to thank everyone who is still here in terms of, of listening in and the questions. I hope you all have a good weekend, that you managed to enjoy meeting up with one other household and enjoy the sunshine. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks Bye very much. Now. Cheers. Bye. I'll just stop the recording. You've ended it. I'll end it now. Okay. Okay, thanks. Right. Is George Godwell? Bye. Bye. Bye.